I am so thrilled this morning to introduce Dr. Sandra Yancey McGuire, who is the Director Emerita of the Center for Academic Success and also retired Assistant Vice Chancellor and Professor of Chemistry at Louisiana State University. Prior to joining LSU in 1999, McGuire spent 11 years at Cornell University where she received the coveted Clark Distinguished Teaching Award. Her latest book, Teach Students How to Learn, Strategies You Can Incorporate into Any Course to Improve Student Metacognition, Study Skills, and Motivation, was released in October 2015 and is a Stylist Publications bestseller. A student version of this book, Teach Yourself How to Learn, Strategies You Can Use to Ace Any Course at Any Level, will be available in January 2018. And I did want you to know that we do have copies of her book on hand at our registration desk, and they, they will be on sale for a 20% discount that the publisher has offered to you all. And you can stop by any time if you're interested and purchase one, and then Dr. McGuire will be signing books for those that are interested from 12.50 after our roundtable sessions to 2 o'clock. So that will be just right outside um, our room here. And she'll also be leading a Q&A session right after this during the first concurrent session at the other end of the room. And you're welcome to stay for that. So Dr. McGuire received her Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry, magna cum laude, from Southern University, her master's degree from Cornell University, and her PhD in chemical education from the University of Tennessee at Knoxville where she received the Chancellor's Citation for Exceptional Promise. McGuire's most recent accolades include the 2017 American Chemical Society Award for encouraging dis disadvantaged students to pursue careers in the chemical sciences and induction into the LSU College of Sciences Hall of Distinction. She also received the 2015 American Association for the Advancement of Science Lifetime Mentor Award and the 2014 Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Organization for the Professional Advancement of Black Chemists and Chemical Engineers. She's an elected fellow of the ACS and the AAAS. And in November 2007, the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics, and Engineering Mentoring was presented to her in a White House Oval Office ceremony. She's married to Dr. Stephen C. McGuire, the James and Ruth Smith Endowed Professor of Physics at Southern University. They are the parents of Dr. Carla McGuire Davis and Dr. Stephanie McGuire, and the doting grandparents of Joshua, Ruth, Daniel, and Joseph Davis. So we are so pleased that you're with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. <laughs> okay. And good morning, everyone. That was a good morning, everyone. Good morning. Okay, great, great, great. I'm in the South. You guys give m much more robust responses than I heard. Okay, I'm really, really pleased uh, to be here to just share with you uh, some things that I am now passionate about but that I didn't know anything about as recently as about 20 years ago. And that is that you really can teach students how to learn. So that's what we're gonna talk about this morning. But first I wanna thank uh, Sandra and the group from CSRDE for inviting me to, uh, to speak to this conference. This is my first time here, and uh, it's just a wonderful conference. And I, I know a little bit about who's here in terms of your um, institutions, types of institutions. But I am wondering, uh, how many people are here for the very first time this year? Oh, wow, OK. How many people have been to between two and five of these? OK, between six and 10, 11 and 15? Okay, <laughs> the staff, more than 15? Okay, great, so we have a lot of first timers here, so, so that is fantastic. Okay, so, oh, I do uh, have a request, and this young man will know exactly who he is, um, and I'm gonna just ask him to wave his hand, and I'm gonna look for him, but uh, someone who had an assignment from me last night, because he did me a favor, 
and he was supposed to come to me before the keynote. And there he is. Thank you very much. Okay, so you have to come up after the keynote then. All right. Okay, so let's get going. So I say that metacognition is the key to increasing retention and graduation rates for all students. And um, I didn't know even what the word metacognition meant as recently as 20 years ago. And I can tell you no one was more surprised than I at how easy it is to teach students learning strategies and to help them be successful. And uh, when I looked at the beautiful cover for the symposium program, uh, beautiful beach scene, and if you haven't had a chance to go out to the beach yet, I really encourage you to do that, beautiful scene. But when I saw that, it reminded me of uh, the starfish story. Uh, how many people here are familiar with that story? Star okay, there are quite a few people who aren't, and so I just want to share that with you because I think that it's very relevant for what we're uh, gonna be talking about today and throughout this conference. An old man was walking on the beach one morning after a storm. In the distance, he could see someone moving like a dancer. As he came closer, he saw that it was a young woman picking up starfish and gently throwing them into the ocean. Young lady, why are you, sh why are you throwing starfish into the ocean? The sun is up and the tide is going out and if I do not draw them in, they will die, she said. But young lady, do you not realize that there are many miles of beach and thousands of starfish? You cannot possibly make a difference. The young woman listened politely, then bent down, picked up another starfish, and threw it into the sea. It made a difference for that one, she said. And I think that's exactly what we in this room are trying to do, is make a difference for each and every one of our students, recognizing that they come to our institutions with different backgrounds, different histories, different learning experiences. And many times they will flounder. They'll find themselves beached and they need someone to help them back in the ocean. And that's what we are, are there to do. And that's a, a very different um, paradigm than was the case as, uh, recently as maybe 25 years ago when our institutions were more teaching centered. So we were very concerned about what courses we are offering, who's gonna teach those courses. But in 2000, I'm sorry, 1995, Barr and Tag wrote a new paradigm for undergraduate education and it really caused that paradigm shift from teaching-centered institutions to learning-centered institutions. And so now our institutions are really focused on not only what are we offering, what are we teaching, but how are we ensuring that students are meeting those student learning outcomes that we have put forth. And uh, we've made a lot of progress, I think, in that uh, effort. And in 2008, George Koo actually uh, came up with practices that he said were high impact educational practices. These are things that were research tested. We know that when institutions implement these, these things, then student success increases. First year seminars and experiences, common intellectual experiences, learning communities, writing intensive courses, collaborative assignments and projects, undergraduate research, etc. In fact, I, I think I want to do something. Let me just see how pervasive these 10 practices are. So if your institution has instituted this, then just raise your hand. And I'll start with first year seminars and experiences. How many of you have those? OK, quite a few. Common intellectual experiences, like a common first year read. OK. Uh, learning communities, how many of you have, fantastic. Writing intensive courses, communication across the curriculum. OK, collaborative assignments and projects. Okay, great, thank you. Undergraduate research. Yeah, that's been a, a big initiative lately. Uh, diversity and global learning. Fantastic. Service learning or community-based learning. Okay, internships. I figured most people would be doing that. And then capstone courses and projects. Absolutely. And so, yeah, many of our institutions are doing a lot of these things, but when Dee Fink, who is an internationally renowned faculty developer, looked at this list, he said, you know, these are great, but they seem to be either institution or curriculum focused and not necessarily focused on what happens in the classroom. And so he came up with what he called five, five high impact teaching practices. And the very first one is change students' view of learning. 
And I was very happy to see that. In fact, he put it on the list, he said, after he heard me talk about metacognition and uh, recognizing that it is so important for us to teach students how to learn and what they're supposed to do. And I recognized that because over the years, I had been to many, many faculty development workshops. They were great workshops. We learned fantastic strategies. But they were all focused on what we as faculty, what we as staff, what we could do at our institutions to increase opportunities for students to learn. But it always seemed to me that we were leaving out 50% of the equation. Because we could be the best faculty, the best staff on the planet, but if students come to the table not understanding what their role in the process is, we're not going to get the kind of learning gains we could if students came to the table understanding what they are supposed to do and they could partner with us in that process as opposed to our having all these programs and we're trying to drag them along. Because some of you have probably noticed that uh, many times students resist active learning strategies. Are you aware of that? Yeah, they just want to come in and sit back and cool out and we want to get them engaged and they're not having it because they don't really understand basic learning principles and how that's going to help them learn. And so if we can change their view of learning, then that will produce a lot of uh, impact. Learning-centered course design, team-based learning, engaging students in service with reflection, that's where service learning comes in, uh, having faculty being a leader with students. So there is a collaboration with the teacher being kind of the leader of the group or the facilitator. And um, as you noticed, changing students' view of learning was number one. And I think that metacognition is the key to changing students' view of learning. And it's also the key to helping each and every individual student recognize what it is they need, what they need to do to improve their, their learning. And so metacognition is just a term that was coined by Flavel back in 1976, uh, cognitive sciences. And uh, very simply put, it's your ability to think about your own thinking. The way I explain it to students is, it's as if you have a big brain outside your brain looking at what your brain is doing. And that big brain is asking your brain questions. And it's saying, does she really understand this information or did she just memorize it last night because the test is today? It's saying, if she has a paper that's due in a couple of weeks, does she recognize that she needs to start thinking about what she's going to write, she needs to start organizing her thoughts, she needs to go to the campus writing center, she needs to talk with the instructor, she needs to develop a draft early enough so that someone could look at it and she has time to revise it or is she just planning to whip it out the night before the way she did in high school. It is your ability to be consciously aware that you are a problem solver. So that when things come up, you don't have to get somebody else to tell you everything. Because for example, most of the questions that students have about classes or, or courses, where could they find that information? On the syllabus, exactly. Many of the questions that they have about financial aid, where could they find those answers? The website, exactly, the financial aid office, yeah. So I think that metacognition takes students out of what I call victim mentality. Have you noticed that today so many students seem to be in victim mode? They need somebody else to tell them everything. Well, if you're using your metacognitive brain, when you come up with a question, the metacognitive brain says, well, we can answer that. And your brain says, well, what am I supposed to do? And the metacognitive brain says, well, what resources do we have? What does the instructor give us? What's on the website? So it allows students to be proactive as opposed to reactive. It's your ability to monitor, plan, and control your mental processing. So you really know if you understand something or if you've just memorized it. It's your ability to accurately judge your level of learning. And that's where so many of our students really flounder because you've probably heard students who weren't successful on an exam and they say, but I studied for hours and hours. Have you heard that? Now those students are not lying. They did engage in what they thought was studying for hours and hours, but what were those students doing, many of them? Okay, now I'm hearing texting, and now, uh, it's, it's sometimes people say texting and on Facebook, and that's true, a lot of them are doing that, but I'm actually not even talking about those students. I'm talking about the students who really thought they were studying, and somebody said cramming, yeah, and what activities were they doing during that cramming? 
Exactly, just rereading, highlighting, memorizing. And so they think they're good, but then when they get to the test, and they would be fine if we asked them questions like, define strong acid, define strong base. But that's not what we do. We give them examples, and we want to know, in a situation in psychology, is this an example of punishment, or is it negative reinforcement? And they're just not prepared to do those kinds of activities because they are operating at a lower level of learning. Now, many times when I go to campuses, I speak to students, and I will ask students, how many of you have heard a professor say, you're in college now, you gotta kick it up a notch. We operate at higher levels. All the hands go up. And then I ask, who thinks you can tell me exactly what are those faculty talking about when they say you gotta kick it up to higher levels? And there are very few hands that go up, and the ones that do go up, they'll say things like, oh, that means college is gonna be harder than high school. Or they'll say, oh, that means that we're gonna have more work to do. Uh, they'll say, we have to take more responsibility. And even though all those things are definitely true, it is missing a very important component of that. Now, I will ask uh, you here, how many of you are not familiar with Bloom's taxonomy? Oh, I'm very surprised because I thought that a lot of people wouldn't be familiar with Bloom because I know we have a lot of people here who are not in academic affairs, so I'm, I'm really encouraged that most people are. Um, how many of you have actively taught students Bloom's taxonomy or shared Bloom's with, okay, great. So I, it looks like less than 10%. So I'm gonna encourage all of us to share Bloom's, whether you're an advisor, whether you're in financial aid, whether you're in academic affairs, student affairs, because Bloom's taxonomy, and I'm gonna go over it for um, those folks who are not really familiar but didn't wanna raise your hand when nobody else was raising their hand. Um, <laughs> But uh, it, it's very important to do that because I think Bloom's is the lens through which students can understand that statement when we say college is at higher levels. And without seeing that, they're kind of in the dark. And whenever I've shared Bloom's with students, the first reaction I get is they'll say, wow, I wish I had known about this in high school. Why didn't somebody tell me about this before? And so we're gonna talk about um, how to do that. And it's your ability to know what you know and what you don't know. So you don't show up for a test or a quiz thinking, okay, I know everything, I'm good. And then you look at the test and it's like, uh-oh, I'm not good. If you are using metacognition, then you will know that when you get to the test. Well, I actually didn't know these things, as, as you heard. Uh, I've been teaching for about 30 years before I came across these concepts. And um, I, in the, the past, I was one of those faculty members, I was very student friendly, always got high evaluations, but I never thought it was my fault when students didn't do well. Because I always had students who made A's and B's, and so the students who failed, I figured they just weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. And then when I started learning about this, I realized that no, it wasn't that students were failing because they just weren't doing what they, well, they weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing, but the reason they weren't is because nobody ever told them what the strategies are. And I used to think that there were certain students who were smart, and there were other students who were not as capable, and now I don't believe that anymore. I don't even believe in the concept that certain students are, so, are smart, certain students are not. I think there are students who've learned strategies for success, and they are using those strategies and are successful, and there are other students who are not successful, not because they are not as capable, but because nobody has taught them those strategies for success. And I can tell you the most surprising thing to me was I didn't realize how easy it is to teach those strategies at the college level and how impactful they are. And I'll show you some examples of that. And throughout the talk, we're gonna talk about specific strategies. So when you go back to your institutions, you can share them with students and um, you're starting as soon as you get back. And uh, I'll also show you some research results. But when I started looking and, and finding out that students really didn't have any learning strategies, my question was, how did these kids get to college and they didn't know these strategies? And so then I found out that it was because it really wasn't necessary in high school. Now, many of you can't see these numbers, but so I'll tell you what they are. These are data from the UCLA Higher Education Research Institute uh, study 
they each year survey first year students, and I've, I've got seven years of data here, and they ask lots of questions, but I'm interested in two of those primarily. The number of hours that students spent doing any homework at all in 12th grade, and then the average that they graduated uh, with from high school. And as you can see, the number who spent even six hours doing any homework in 12th grade um, has not reached 45% yet. High of 44.8 in 2015, um, low of 37.3, but at least it's moving in the right direction. They, they are spending more time. But if you look at the percent who graduated with an A average, what you see is that in 2013, it crossed 50%, almost 53%. And so what, and it's 55.1 uh, in, um, in 2016. But what, you're, what this shows then is that students are not spending any time at all doing any homework or anything outside of class in high school, but they're doing fine. They're making A's. And so when they get to our institutions, they don't know that there's anything they need to do differently because what they've been doing has always been successful. And so um, I, I actually um, dug a little bit deeper into this. And I'm just going to, I'm going to ask a lot of questions during this talk. There are no right or wrong answers. I just want to know what you're thinking. And so you'll just kind of have to, to yell out the answers. In some cases, I'll ask questions and, and I'll ask individual people to respond. And I'll just have you raise your hand and then I'll call on, on people to do that. Uh, but for this one, I think that we can just yell out in unison. Uh, when I ask students, what did most of your teachers teachers in high school do the day before the test. What do you think they told me? Review. Review, exactly. I was not surprised by that. In fact, that's exactly what I expected them to say. And I was all set to tell them that, well, at the next question, I said, well, what did they do? What did your teachers do during the review? And I was all set to respond with, you know, we don't do that in college. You have to do that for yourself. But what do you think students told me the teachers did during the review? Okay, I'm hearing some people say it. Tell them what was on the test and what? And gave them the answers. I was shocked. How many people knew that? That typically in high school, raise your hand if you knew that. Yeah, okay, so less than a third of the audience. I was, was shocked. But so many times in high school, the students before the test, they're, they're getting a review sheet that has all the questions and they go over it and they get the answers. And when I first heard that, I was really surprised. And I was thinking, why would teachers do that? Um, but now I know, and this is the only political statement I'll make this whole talk, but I think, I think that we have put teachers in such an untenable position where we, oh, I'm getting, yeah, I, I didn't even know what that meant until about a year ago. I, saw, so I said, what is this? Uh, but yeah, we are holding teachers accountable for the scores that their students make on these standardized tests. And if they don't make a certain score, then the teacher may be homeless next year because they're going to lose the job the school is given over to somebody else. And so given the pressure of making sure that students perform on these standardized tests, uh, teachers told me that some teachers will think that if they give students the items and the answers, they will know it for the test and be able to do well. Well, of course, you and I know that that's not the case, but it did help me understand why before the test, so many students want the faculty to give them what? A study guide or a review sheet, exactly. And they're expecting that all the questions, all the answers are going to be there. And if they're, so they're, they're just going to memorize that. And if we don't give them that, then they get very upset. Now, I am not opposed to review sheets at all. But I think students need to construct their own review sheets. And we may have to show them how to do that, how to use the syllabus, how to use the notes, how to use the textbook to turn those headings into questions to come up with their own review sheet, but have them do it. And there have been faculty who have done that with, uh, with great success. Yeah, and so they said, you know, they gave them the, the questions and the answers. And I was very surprised, but then I followed that up and I said, oh, okay, well, if they did that, if you never went to class except the day before the test and you went to class that day and you paid really close attention, what's the lowest score you would have made on the test the next day? And just yell it out, what score do you think they, what grade do you think they told me? I'm hearing a lot of C's. Very few students said C. B. A few students said A. A few students said C. Most of them said B. 
And even though most students, when I, they come to our institutions, they want to make all A's, but they're not going to be too unhappy if they make B's. And so that helped me understand why there were so many students who never did anything coming up to the first test. Because they just figured that, well, the review sheet is coming, and I'll just memorize it the night before. And so we have to help students understand that that's not the case. Now, it is, there's so many reports that say that students are not ready for college. Uh, the SAT report on college and career readiness, this is 2013, but the numbers haven't really changed, said that fewer than 50%, fewer than half of all SAT takers were academically prepared for the college level, for the rigors of college level coursework. And then the ACT was alarmed by US student reports. 31% uh, of students were still unready for college in English, math, reading, or science, every subject that was tested by the ACT. And then just recently, uh, this is from October 19, 2017, some colleges now are recognizing that SAT and ACT scores are really not the best predictor of college success. And so the California colleges are dumping test scores and they're adopting GPA to define college readiness. And uh, do you think they're going to find that the students who have all A's from high school are college ready? <laughs> no. Uh, I think that it, it may be a step in the right direction, but I, I still don't think that that's going to determine quote unquote college readiness. Now, I agree. I have no qualms, no disagreement with the idea that our students are coming to our institutions unprepared for college work. What I vehemently disagree with is the notion that if they come even woefully unprepared, that they can't still be very successful in our institutions if we know how to teach them the skills that they need to, to implement. Because let's face it, you know, next year, do we think the students coming out are going to be a lot more prepared than last year? or the year after that? Yeah, it's not like there's this cadre of prepared students who are just waiting for our um, admissions people, our recruiters to find them to come to our institutions. No, those people aren't out there. And so we have to teach the students, we have to work with and teach the students we have, not the students we wish we had. And if we are totally honest with ourselves, we are not the faculty and staff the students wish they had either. Uh, <laughs> But, but we're all they have, they're all we have. And if we work together, we can make this thing happen. And so faculty and staff really have to help students make that transition to college. We have to help them identify the gap between the current behavior and attitudes that they come to college with that's resulting in their current level of learning and current grades and the productive behavior that they're going to have to engage in in order to get the desired learning and the desired grades. And so I want to just tell you a, a quick story to show you the power of metacognition. This is a young lady, um, Sydney, who I met at a, uh, when I was doing a presentation, learning strategies presentation to students in an honors chemistry class at LSU. And uh, the, it was September 23rd. And I can tell you, I learned the hard way. Many times people hear this information and faculty say, oh, I'm going to teach this on the first day of class. Wrong. I learned the hard way that if we talk to students about learning strategies before they've gotten the first test results back, yeah, it doesn't make a difference. Because what is typically their attitude if we say somebody's going to talk about learning and they haven't gotten the results back from the first test? What are they thinking? Exactly, I don't need this. Maybe she's talking to all the other dummies in the room, but, <laughs> but I, I certainly don't need this. In fact, I often say, they go into Beyonce mode. They say, if she thinks I need to know about this, she must not know about me. She must not know about me. <laughs> And so they are not paying attention. And uh, the other thing we learned is you can't tell somebody that the next day somebody's going to talk about learning, because if you do that, what's going to happen? They're not going to show up, exactly. And so I was there to, uh, to, to conduct this class. And I got there very early, as I did this morning, to get everything set up. Oh, let's give Richard a round of applause. Where are you? Oh, there's Richard. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
Uh, he's the, the wonderful tech person. I always give tech people challenges, and so I always like to get places really early, so they, they always figure it out, but it takes a little bit of time, and Richard was fantastic. But I got to this, the classroom really early, and Sydney was the only person in the room. She was sitting on the front row, and she looked up and she saw me, and she said, oh, are you going to teach us today? And so I said, yeah. She said, what are you going to talk about? I said, I'm going to talk about learning strategies. How did you do on the first test? And she said, oh, I did great on the first test. And I was really surprised, because I didn't think I had done that well, but I made a 97.5. And I said, oh. Now, the, re the reason I said, oh, was I knew that the first test was worth, was worth a total of 150 points. <laughs> but, but I didn't know if she had converted that to percent, and she made 97.5 percent. So I said, oh. So, well, you know, the first test was worth 150. So was your 97.5 out of 100 or 150? And she got this deer in the headlights look on her face, and she said, I don't know, let me check. So she went to the course website, and I was watching her as she was watching her laptop, and I saw these crocodile tears start to flow down her face. And I said, but don't worry about that, because what we're going to talk about today is going to turn all that around. And I tell students all the time, I tell students, you know, I don't care if you made a two on the first test. I know that you can make a hundred on the next test, because your two had nothing to do with how smart you are. It had everything to do with your behaviors before the test. And I can show you how to do some things differently. And when you do that, you'll be successful. So I told Sydney, don't worry about that, because today what we're going to talk about is going to turn all that stuff around. And she just looked at me and she said, no, you don't understand. She said, I just got my first calculus test back yesterday, and I made a D on that too. And she was pre-med, so she thought that her college career, her life was over. And um, I said, but don't even worry about that. You know, just, you know, we're going to take care of that. And so she was very attentive during the presentation, as, as students are. Students love this stuff. When we talk to them about learning strategies that they've not heard anything about, they really are engaged. And that's why I like to use the term metacognition. Because uh, back in the old days, we would call it study skills. Yeah, study skills. Well, students' eyes glaze over when you talk about study skills. They don't want to know study skills. But if we talk about learning strategies or metacognitive learning strategies, you know, then that gets their attention and they're, they're interested. And uh, so she was very attentive. And so I got an email from her October 14th. And she said, uh, Dr. McGuire, this is Sydney from the uh, chemistry class, the honors chemistry class. And I'm happy to, tell you, happy to tell you that I got my second calculus test back yesterday. And I made a 100% this time. <laughs> and so she made an A on calculus. And she said, I have my uh, first chemistry, my second chemistry test coming up next week, and I'm feeling really good about it using the strategies that we talked about. I didn't hear from her, but I got a copy of the email that the instructor sent her congratulating her on her A on that next test. And I didn't hear from her anymore that semester. And I was speaking in Indiana on January 9th. And I wondered, you know, what happened? You know, how did the semester turn out? Did she stay on the wagon? Did she fall off the wagon? Because many times students will start using the strategies and then they fall off. Kind of like those of us who uh, take out those gym memberships uh, January 1st of every year <laughs> and then kind of stop. So I emailed her how the semester turned out. And she said, I'm so happy you emailed me. I'm happy to tell you that I made a 4.0 last semester. And um, I always ask, and I'm going to ask you, if you're teaching students or not, if you're an advisor, if you are in IR and you're talking with students, and because now you'll be able to have strategies that you can tell students, um, I encourage you to, when students, uh, tell them, you know, come back and let me know how, how it went, and they will improve. And then ask them to send you an email telling you exactly what they did differently because it's that set of strategies that you can compile and you can present those to other students and you can tell them that you know this is what students did and they really improved. And so I asked uh, Sydney to send me the email and she did. I got it on January 20th and what she said was the thing that made the difference for her was when she changed the way she did her homework. And we'll talk about specifically what that strategy is. Didn't hear from her spring semester, emailed her May 7th, and she emailed me again right back. She made another 4.0. And then I didn't hear from her for a couple of years, um, but then now she's back on track to get into med school. So she emailed me July 26th. She wanted me to be one of her recommenders for medical school. And I said, you know, absolutely, of course. 
And um, so on February 7th, uh, she emailed me uh, to give me the information I needed, and her QM was now up to 3.6, and her fall semester GPA was 4.18, because we have A pluses at, at LSU. And she graduated last spring, and this is she, Sydney Landry. And um, her final semester, she had a 3.77, and so she's back on her way to uh, going to medical school. She wants to be a dermatologist. And so many of our students, they, they have their goals. She'd been volunteering in a dermatologist's office since high school. But her first couple of tests, she thought that that was out the window. And so I'm going to share the first strategy with you, this homework strategy. And I'm going to ask you, if anybody did this, raise your hand. And unfortunately, my hand will be raised because I did this. How many of us, um, think back to whenever you're doing homework, how many of us, if we had a problem or a question for homework, would read the question or read the problem and then flip back in the chapter to find an example? I'm seeing some chuckles, so I know some of us did. Yeah, to see an example of the problem we had to work or a discussion of the question we had to answer. If you ever did that, raise your hand. Yeah, all of the students are doing that. And although I didn't know most of this stuff when I was at Cornell, the one thing that I did learn was the reason that my students at Cornell were making C's, D's, or F's on exams when they could have been making A's and B's was because of that one habit. And so when I ask students if you do that, you know, they all raise their hand. And so then I ask them and I'll ask you, because I did the same thing, you saw my hand up. When we did that, were we working the problem or answering the question? Were we? No. What was working the problem or answering the question? What was doing it? The book, exactly. And, and part of this approach is not telling students information, but asking them questions, just the way I'm asking you. Because I used to tell students, you know, you can't do this, you need to do that. But that doesn't have nearly the same impact as if we ask them questions to have them connect to their experience. And then they will give us the information that we are trying to give them. And so, yeah, they'll say the book. They'll say the author, the example. I said, absolutely. Now, how many of you remember thinking when you saw the way the problem was worked or you saw the discussion of the question thinking, oh, yeah, I understand that. Oh, yeah, I got that. And students say, yeah. And I said, yeah, and I thought the same thing. But when we got to the test or the quiz, if they changed anything at all around, what happened? Yeah, and they said, no, I don't, I don't got that. And so there is a, a specific way to not have that happen. In fact, how many of you have heard students say, well, I do fine on the homeworks, but I failed the test? Yet yeah, this is the reason this is happening, because if they're using the book to do the homework, they're not even giving themselves a chance to, to, not, to, to make any mistakes. And so what we suggest they do instead is before you look at the first question of the first homework problem, you have to study the information. Study it as if it's going to be on a test or a quiz the very next day. Just focus in on it. And when you are doing that, whether you're using your notes or the textbook, you're going to come across examples. And I'll ask students, what do you do now when you get to an example, whether it's in your notes or the book? And I can tell you, I was surprised by the answer because I didn't do this. But what do you think students do when they get to an example? Skip it. Yeah, skip it. How many of you knew that students skip all the examples? Okay, most of you are like me. I had no idea because I didn't skip the examples. Now, some of them will say, I read the example and I read what the author did. But I don't want them to do that either. If they've studied the information, then most of them will be able to do the, uh, the problem or answer the question based on what they've learned. So I said, so you've got to read the, the question and then just work it. And even if you're not sure exactly what to do next, just power your way through until you get to an answer. And when you get to an answer, just compare the answer, just the answer, with the answer that's in the book. If you got the same answer, then you can look at what the author did. But if you didn't get the same answer, don't look yet. Try to figure out where your mistake was. And I ask students, I'll say, at this point in the process, do you think making a mistake is good or bad? And what do you think students tell me? Interesting. OK, I, I didn't know if you were going to give me a different answer. Um, when I ask uh, faculty groups this, they always say bad. But I'm saying, OK, but these are retention folks, student success folks. So maybe they'll, they're, they're like students. You, we're like our colleagues, uh, the faculty. Um, students always say good. I have never had a student group say bad. 
I've never had a faculty group say good. But students will say, when I say, is it uh, um, you know, good or bad if you make a mistake at this point, students always say good. And then I'll ask, well, why? And then I'll say, I agree with you. I think it's good. But don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's bad if you don't make a mistake at this point. It's fantastic if you don't make a mistake at this point. But why is it good if you make a mistake at this point? And they're so on target. What do you think they tell me? I'm here. Yeah, they say you learn from your mistakes. That's the number one thing they say. They say you learn from your mistakes. What else do you think they say? Yeah, it doesn't count, <laughs> they'll say. Uh, it's not the test, and so you're not losing points. And sometimes they'll say you now know where your brain is having a tendency to go wrong. And all of those things are, are correct. And so uh, then once they understand that, and they haven't really thought about that before we ask the question. But once we ask the question, then they really see that if I make a mistake at this point, it's good because I can correct the mistake. And then I'll ask, in fact, I'll ask you, how many of you have ever uh, heard students say, well, you know, I had this test and I didn't do well, but I just made simple mistakes. I made so many simple mistakes. Have you heard that? Yeah. And I tell students, you know, my position is that there's no such thing as simple mistakes. Mistakes only look simple in retrospect. Once you know what the right thing is, your mistake looks so simple. But mistakes are things that have to be made. And either you're going to make them during this process, or where are you going to make them? On the test. Students are telling me this. They're telling me I'm going to make it on the test. And so these are the kinds of experiences that we have to put students through to help them understand the behaviors that they have to change. Let me let this catch up. Check to see if it's correct. If it's not, figure out where the mistake was without consulting the solution. And then that's just the examples. Once you get to the homework problems, work the homework problems as if you're on a test or a quiz. Speed it up. Because many times, students will run out of time on tests, not because they don't know the information, but on their homework, they have as much time as they need. They plot through it very carefully, very slowly. When they get to the test, they do the same thing. And so they run out of time. So they have to practice speeding things up. And this is what Sydney did. And this is the email she sent me. She said, I started to use the get more out of your homework method. I reviewed my notes before attempting my homework problems and tried to work the problems without help from the solutions manual or tutors. If I still couldn't get the right answer, I'd look at my notes again to get a hint, but not to study the problem and mimic it step by step. And so if no matter what office we're in, we can just, if we have time to just ask a student, you know, how are you doing your homework? And go over this process with them. It will make a difference for so many students. And so now what I want to do is take a little bit of time to take you through the process that I'll take students through because it's really important that they understand the connection between what they were doing and their performance, their learning and performance, and what they need to do. So I'm going to ask a couple of reflection questions and I'm going to ask you to take about 20 seconds to get your own answer and then take a minute or so to discuss with people at your table and we'll come back in a couple minutes to see how we feel about these as a group. And so the first question is, what's the difference, if you think there's any difference at all, between studying and learning? And then for the second question, I'm going to give you two scenarios, and I'm going to ask if you would work harder for one of these than the other. First scenario, I say, next week, we're going to have the second test in this course. And you did horribly on the first test. And so you have to make an A on this next test if you expect to do reasonably well in this course. So you know how hard you would work for that. Second scenario, I say, we're going to have the next test in this course next week. And I've decided that I'm going to give the class what they wanted me to do before the first test, but I, I refused to do it. Everybody wanted me to offer a review session. They said, are you going to give us a review session? I said, no, we don't do review sessions in college. You, you can study the stuff on your own. So I refused to give a review session. But the class did horribly. And so I'm going to offer a review session before this next test, the session before this next test, and you are going to teach that review session. I'm going to have you come up to the front of the class. You're going to explain all of the concepts, paying particular attention to the more difficult concepts to make sure everybody is prepared for the test the next day. Would you work harder for one of those than the other? And if so, which one? So again, take about 15 seconds to get your own answer and then talk with folks at your table. And we'll come back in a couple of minutes and see what we as a group think about that. So start thinking and talking. 
Okay, let's see what we came up with. And I can tell you, when you talk with a group of students and ask this question, the engagement is exactly what we saw here. The, nobody's ever asked these questions, but they actively engage in it, and they come up with great responses. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask um, three people to share their answers. Um, I, and usually, if I have more time, I'd get more responses. Uh, with students, I you know, get as many responses as they want to give. But in the interest of time, I'll have three people uh, to respond. And I want to know who those three people are. And I'll point you out and give you a number. And you have to remember what your numbers are. I won't remember what they are. Uh, but let me just start with the first one. Is there anybody who would say that studying and learning are exactly the same thing? Okay, and that's typically not the, that's typically the case. Nobody says they're exactly the same thing. Who is willing to share with the group how you characterized the difference between studying and learning? Okay, here's my number one. I need two more. Um, two. Okay, and then three back there. Did I see? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so number one, what did you say? Okay, yes, and that is one of the things that students say. They will say, studying is short term, learning is long term. And one young lady actually said, ah, studying is what I do the night before the test to make an A. Yeah. But learning is what I do if I need to understand that information and use it later. Thank you very much. Where was my number two? Uh, yes. Um, we said that the difference is between being credentialed and being educated. Okay, I've never heard that from students. Uh, he said. <laughs> He said the difference is being credentialed and being educated. So I'm going to come back to that because students do say something that gets to that. They don't say it in those terms, but I think that, yeah, so we'll, we'll come back to that. Where's my number three? Yes. Studying is observing, gathering information, and imagining even if you're really good at it, what might happen. And learning is walking across the room and asking the girl's hand. Okay. So, um, yeah, they've never said it in quite those words either. Uh, but, but I think both of you are saying what I do hear from students. Uh, the number one thing that students say is they'll say, ah, studying is just memorizing information for a test or a quiz. But learning is when I understand that information, when I can apply it, when I can relate it to something that I already know. And um, the other thing they say, they say the short term, the long term. Uh, one young lady said, ah, studying is like being put in front of a plate of gruel and being force fed it. Whereas learning is like being set in front of a gourmet table where you get to pick and choose what you want to eat. So they'll say, you know, studying is tedious, learning is fun. Um, and those are the main things that they'll say. So they recognize that there's a difference. And so then I said, well, if we take as the difference that studying is just memorizing information for a test or a quiz, but learning is when you understand that and you can use it. Up to this point in time, would you say you've been more in study mode or in learn mode? And what do you think they tell me? Study mode. They don't even know there's a learn mode to be in. Absolutely. So that's the first part of the problem. And then for the second one, I think we can just do that one in unison. Uh, for which one would you work harder, A or B? B. B. That's what all the students say. And when I ask them, why would you work harder for B, what do you think they tell me? OK, and I'm hearing people say it. Yeah, they'll say, well, for, the most common thing they say is, well, I got to really know it if I have to teach it. And very often, faculty and staff laugh at this, like, well, didn't they know that they really had to know it to make an A on the test? <laughs> and no, they didn't, because that has not been their experience. Their experience has been, I don't have to know anything. I just get the review sheet, I memorize the information, and I'm good. And so, no, they, there's no way for them to know that. So that's the first thing they say. Well, I've got to really know it if I have to teach it. And then uh, the other thing they say is, um, I don't want to look stupid in front of the class. They say that, you know, now I want to make sure that I can explain things very well. I'm anticipating questions because I want to be able to a answer questions that people are going to ask because I don't want to look stupid. And many times those questions they're anticipating are the questions that are going to be on the test or quiz. And then sometimes, uh, and these are the uh, more, I think, empathetic students, they will say, ah, everybody's grade is dependent upon what I do. 
And so I want to make sure I can explain it more than one way. I can use pictures for the visual learners. I can use diagrams, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and even though we're not talking about learning styles today, I do talk about it in the book. And I do recognize, oh, how many, let me just ask, how many of you know that learning styles have fallen into ill repute lately? OK, yes. Well, I put the study in the book that allegedly debunked learning styles. And I put the paper that debunked the study that debunked learning styles. Uh, and so um, how many of you have used learning styles and found that it's made a positive impact on students? Yeah. And so I was really dismayed when allegedly research said that it, there was nothing to it. Because uh, I see that it makes a big difference. And I came to learning styles as a disbeliever, as a strong disbeliever. Um, but then I saw the impact that it had on students. And I say in the book, you know, who knows? Maybe it's a placebo. I don't know. But I do know that students will do things when they think certain actions are congruent with their preferred learning style. We call them learning style preferences. That if they didn't have that information, they don't have access to that. And um, the main complaint about learning styles was, you know, we don't want students to put themselves in a box and say, well, I'm just a visual learner. I can't learn if I don't see pictures. Well, that's not the case. But the answer to that is to have them learn the strategies for all the different styles. And so even if your preference is visual, if you know the strategies that read-write learners use, if you're in an environment that has no pictures, then you still know useful strategies. And so, but they're saying, you know, I've got to present it in more than one way. So they know that they, uh, they're going to work harder and delve into it, to it deeply if they have to teach the material. And so then I ask them, up to this point in time, have you been more in scenario A mode or scenario B mode? And what do you think they tell me? A, exactly. They've all been working to make A's on the test instead of preparing to teach the material. And so then I tell them, you know, the good news is you don't have to be in, uh, you don't have to have your own class to be in teach the material mode. If you have empty chairs in your room, if you have stuffed animals, if you have imaginary friends, <laughs> if, you, if you have any audience that you got pets, you have you know, young kids, you have any audience that you can just pretend you're teaching the material to, it makes a huge difference. And the reason is this. How many of us have ever been in a situation where we thought we understood something totally, and we were explaining it to somebody, and we got to a point where, hmm, I'm not so sure about this part. That ever happened? Yeah, when I ask students, it happens to them too. And I, and I tell them it happens to everybody. And they said, yes, now if you had been in a situation where you were explaining course material to someone and you got stuck, if you hadn't been explaining this to someone, when would you have found out that you didn't totally understand this information? And when would it have been? On the test, exactly. And so now they know that they've got to vet their knowledge by pretending they're teaching it. And so I taught this strategy. I was teaching, uh, I was doing a presentation to students at Eastern Kentucky University. Uh, and then this young man, the, the presentation was October 29, 2015. And there was a psychology graduate student who was studying for a licensure exam. And um, he sent me um, an email in January. He said, I really like this strategy about teaching the material. I'm studying for this big exam, and I'm kind of nervous about it, but I'm going to try that strategy. He said, and I live alone, but I have a baby Groot plant. And so I'm going to teach the information to baby Groot. And so he messaged me through Facebook on April 14th, and he said he and baby Groot were having a good time with the material. He was making great progress. And then he messaged me June 11th, and he uh, had just gotten his scores back, and he was so excited, and he said he made a score way higher than he needed to get his license. And he was pretty sure if baby Groot had taken the test, he would have passed it also. <laughs> and uh, we had a vet school student who was flunking animal physiology. And she made an A. And I, as you heard, I always ask students to tell me what they did differently. So she came back to the office and said, oh, tell me what you did. And she looked at me. She said, Dr. McGuire, I have the smartest dog in animal <laughs> physiology on the planet. She said, every day I would go home and I would teach him the information I'd learned. And so I think no matter what office we're in, it could be financial aid, it could be anything, if students are talking about academic woes, if you just ask me, how's everything going? Are you, you know, doing well in all your classes? Well, no, there's this one I'm not doing so well. Well, you know, give me a topic that you've talked about and teach it to me. Just teach it to me. And I think that they will see that they are not in a position to teach that, and so they haven't mastered the material the way they needed to, and you could give them uh, this strategy. 
And so now what I want to do is briefly tell you about two students and again share some additional strategies with you. Um, this first student was Travis who was in psychology and he made a 47 and a 52 on the first two tests. And I talked to him about 30 minutes before the third exam because have you noticed our students are so busy. They were just so busy. His uh, instructor had wanted him to talk to me before that, but he couldn't get in. So I talked to him about 30 minutes on the phone the night before, and I was thinking he would make in the low to mid 70s. I figured 20 point bump after 30 minutes on the phone. That's what I was expecting. Well, he made an 82. And he was so excited, he called and he said, Dr. McGuire made an 82 on that test. And I said, wow, Travis, that's fantastic. If you make higher than Ann, and I was trying to think of a stretch score that he wouldn't make higher than. I said, if you make higher than an 85 on your next test, I will take you to lunch. And I really didn't think he would make higher than 85 because <laughs> I thought the 82 was a fluke. And, <laughs> and I thought at least statistical regression would kick in. <laughs> But he calls back three weeks later, Dr. McGuire made an 86. And so I said, wow, Travis, that's fantastic. Let me look at my calendar and I'll get back to you with a lunch date. So in the meantime, I called the professor to verify that, <laughs> that this self-reported 86 was what he made. And she said, yeah, he made an 86. I took him to lunch. I said, Travis, what are you doing? He said, I'm just doing that stuff you told me to do. And with Travis, it was a reading strategy. So many of our students come to our institutions not having good reading strategies. And I'll teach you one that is so simple. You can teach the students in, in 10 minutes. Um, and I'm going to tell you that right after I introduce you to Dana, who is a first year physics student, who I met after she made 54. Uh, and she was a first year student, as I said, and she was ready to leave physics. I met her at a change your major workshop. Now, I, I wasn't teaching, you know, I wasn't teaching the workshop. I was just wondering, you know, what do they do in a change your major workshop? And so I went to the workshop, and uh, the counselor asked everybody to introduce themselves, tell what they were majoring in, what they were going to change to. And Dana said, well, my name is Dana, and I, was, I wanted to major in physics, but that's not working out so well, so I need to change. And I'll never forget this. The, the counselor said, oh, yeah, I understand, because physics is hard. And she said it just like that. And so as Dana was leaving, I met her at the door. I said, Dana, do you have about an hour you can spend with me in the office? And so she said, sure. And I said, look, I'm not going to try to talk you out of leaving physics. Because if you really want to do something else, that is absolutely fine with me. But I want you to know that you're leaving not because you can't do it, but because you've chosen to do something else. And so she came to the office. We had one session. And those were her scores after. She ended up with a 4.0 that semester. And I found out that she was from Houston. And her mom worked at the MD Anderson uh, Cancer Center. And since 10th grade, she had been talking with the medical physicists in that office. And that's what she wanted to do as her life's work. But after the 54, in fact, she was alarmed at the 80 because she was a straight A student in high school, but after the 54, she was, was out of there. But um, let me tell you about Travis. So Travis's problem, as so many of our students have a problem with reading comprehension. And the little strategy that I learned, I actually learned when I went to a six-week summer workshop because there were so many LSU students coming to our office saying, you know, can you help me with reading? Because I'm not getting the most out of my reading. And these were graduate students uh, included. And I didn't know how to teach people how to read. I was a chemistry professor. In fact, I thought I knew how to read before I went to this workshop and found <laughs> out that, that I really didn't. But uh, what we learned at the workshop was the reason that most people don't get the most out of their reading is you start to read, you get a little ways in, and then your mind starts to wander. And so the way to prevent that is to work with your brain the way it works best. If we know from cognitive science research that if the brain has a big picture, if it has an overview of what, what it's about to learn, and then it gets individual details to fill in that big picture, it's much more efficient than if it just starts out getting individual details trying to create its own big picture. And so you've got to first preview the text before you start to read. So if I were reading a chapter, let's say, on assets and bases, I would see things. And previewing just means look at the bold-faced print, the italicized words, any charts or graphs, so you give your brain the big picture. And so I would see strong acid, weak acid, strong base, weak base, in italics or in bold-faced print. And then the next thing is to develop questions that you expect the reading to answer for you. So I might say, well, I wonder what this thing is going to say is the difference between strong acids and weak acids. 
And so you've given yourself a purpose for doing the reading. And then when you start to read, just read the first paragraph. Stop, put that information in your own words, paraphrase that information, and then read the second paragraph. Stop, put that information in your own words, trying to fold in what was in the first paragraph, and read the third paragraph the same way. And when I explain this to students, I always stop at this point, and I'll ask you, does it sound like if I got to do all that, it's going to take a long time to finish the reading? Yeah, and students always say yes. But I tell students that the students who try this, they will come back. I don't even have to ask them. They'll say, wow, that reading thing is great. I've taught this to law school students, med school students, dental school students. And they all say the same thing. They say, it's really great. So then I'll ask them, are you finding that when you use that, sh that process, is it taking you longer to get through the reading than what it was doing before? And to a person, they say, well, no. Actually, I finished the reading sooner doing it this way than what I was doing before. So my question to you is, why should it take less time to finish the reading doing all this than what they were doing before? Anybody have any idea? OK, yes, I'm hearing both answers. The two answers students say is, you're not doing all that rereading. And that's exactly right. The old way, you would read a little bit, but then you have to go back. Read, go back, read, go back, read, go back, read, go back. With the new way, you are moving more slowly through the material, but you get to the end point sooner because you're not doing all that back and forth. And then the other thing students say is you're more focused. They recognize that because of the questions, you're focused in on the reading. And so this is a, a reading strategy that, that any one of us can share with students, and it makes a huge difference. And so now what I want to do is a little activity with you to demonstrate this. So on the next slide, there is going to be a short passage, and I'm going to ask you to read it, and then I'll take it off the screen, and I'll ask you a question about it. So let oh, I'm sorry, it's going to be the next one. This one is just a summary of that reading strategy. So survey, look at the introduction, summary of old print, come up with questions you want the reading to answer, then do that one paragraph at a time while summarizing in your own words. And then one of the R R's is uh, annotating or writing in the margin. And then review, after you've got to the end of a section, review what's in that section. And then reflect. If it is a social science book that puts forth some theories, then just ask, do I believe this? Do I think of other ways to do it? If it's a math textbook, uh, in this chapter, what parts of this were not as easy for me to understand? If I were in a conversation with the author, what section would I ask him or her to rewrite? So it's really active reading. So the next slide is going to be this passage. And there it is. So I just want you to read that. Okay, I'm going to take it off the screen. You may not have finished it yet. I always wish I had a camera at this point that I could project your <laughs> expressions on the screen. Some people are squinting forward. Some people are leaning back. Some people are laughing. It's like, this is ridiculous. Uh, but let me just ask, um, if, I, if you haven't seen this, and some of you may have seen it, but if you haven't seen it before, is there anybody who thinks you could summarize the information that was on that slide? Probably. Oh, oh you think you could. Okay, tell, tell us what it is. Okay, I would give you 50 points out of a 100-point question for that, absolutely. But everybody else got zero, so you'd have an A in the class. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes? Okay, yeah, so uh, you'd get 100. It really is about um, Christopher Columbus, the first voyage of Christopher Columbus. So now I want, oh, how many people were thinking that? Oh, OK, a few, yes. Uh, um, so I want you to reread it again and just shake your head up and down, yes, or back and forth, no, if it makes more sense to you now. Yeah, because now we know what the egg, not a planet. I mean, <laughs> egg, not a planet. Egg, not a table, correctly typifies this unexplored planet. We now know who the three sturdy ships were. 
So we know what the context is, and we now understand the passage. And I always uh, recommend that faculty just take a passage from, a, from your course, something you haven't talked about before, have them read it, and then tell them what it's about. And then they can see that if they take the time to preview, it makes a big difference. And if we don't have classes, just really explaining to students what the process is, preview before you start to read, come up with questions, and read the paragraph, summarizing it. That's enough for many students to significantly improve their reading. And that's the reference for, um, for that passage. And so, you know, back to Dana, uh, her problem was she was just memorizing formulas and using this website, cramster.com. How many people have, <laughs> yeah, how many people have heard of Chegg? Okay, Cramster um, was bought out by Chegg. And when Dana told me that she was using Cramster, I said, Dana, that's cheating. You're cheating because she seemed like she had a lot of integrity. I said, you're cheating. She said, oh, no, 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 Dr. McGuire, I would never cheat. She said, I'm just looking at that to get a hint about how to start the problems. And I said, but Dana, when you get to the test, do they give you a hint about how to start the problems? And she recognized that that's what was derailing her performance. And so she stopped that. And she graduated from uh, LSU in uh, 2012 with a degree in physics, 3.8 GPA. She got a full fellowship to do her master's uh, in medical physics, and she did her research at the MD Anderson Cancer Center uh, as part of the UT Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences. And she completed her residency last summer, and she is a happy camper being what, doing what she always wanted to do. And so I think that when we know specific strategies to tell students, we can help them when they flounder, not to lose faith, lose confidence in themselves, but it, it's more than just telling them, you, you can do better, you, you need to work harder, because that doesn't mean anything. But when we give them specific strategies and ask them questions to help them connect their lack of success up to this point with behaviors and not with their intelligence, it makes a big difference. Now, Sydney, the young lady that I talked about, she told me that she and her mom, after they found out she made those two Ds, they had decided that maybe she was high school smart, but not college smart. Yeah, and this is what happens to a lot of our, our students. And um, so now I want to do a little activity with you that shows you why I am so confident that students could make a 30 on the first test and 100 on, uh, 90 or 100 on the next test. So on this next slide, there are going to be, a, on the one after this one, series of words or short phrases, and they'll have vowels in them. And I'm going to give you 45 seconds to count the vowels on the list, and I want to see how accurately you can count them. If you finish before 45 seconds are up, just go back and recount and make sure you have exactly the right number of vowels. And I'll give you a five second warning. Is everybody ready? Okay, let's start counting the vowels now. Five seconds, and stop. Now what I would like to know is <laughs> how many of the words or phrases you remember from the slide. Anybody think you remember 10 or more? There were 15 words or phrases. Uh, have you seen it before? OK, <laughs> yes. OK, uh, if you haven't seen this before, <laughs> yes. OK, um, so raise the, uh, your hand when I get to the number you did remember. Nine. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, uh, looks like our average was probably somewhere between two and three, so I'll give us the benefit of the doubt and say three. That was 20%. Now, I want you to look at the words again. If you look at them from top to bottom, you're going to find that they are arranged according to something. And when you see what they're arranged according to, just yell it out. Number. 
numbers exactly. And so what I would do next, but uh, I want to uh, make sure that in the interest of time that we finish on time, so we're not going to go through this whole thing exactly as we would, but I would give you 45 seconds to memorize the words or phrases. And when that happens, typically there are a lot of people who get all 15. The average is usually about 80%. And so the point of this little exercise is we're not any smarter people in the room than we were five minutes before you know, we, we figured out how to memorize the words after we knew how they were arranged. But we could do so much better, so how, and the, I'll tell you, the average usually will be about 12. But there were two major differences between the first and second attempt. And what was one of the differences? We knew what we were looking for. Exactly. I told you count the vowels. I wanted to know the words. The way this impacts our students is they have to know exactly what it is we are requiring them to do. If we tell them read a passage, uh, they are hearing the task as I want your eyes to fall over every other word while you're texting it on Facebook. When what we mean is I want you to come to class, read this, come to class prepared to lead the class in a discussion of this information. And they will do something different if they know what they have to do differently. And because um, when I was in, in school, I thought that what my chemistry professors wanted me to do, when they gave us homework assignments, I thought the task was just to turn in the problems done correctly. Well, I used the examples and I did that. But then I realized that wasn't their task at all. They wanted us to understand the concepts behind the questions, the problems. Not just do those problems, but any other problems that were related. I can't go all the way back there now, but if I could, I, I'm pretty sure I would have done something differently if I'd known the real task. So we need to make sure students know what the task is. And then what was the other difference? What was the other difference? Mnemonics. Mnemonics, yeah, we had something that we could connect the information to. We knew that it was related to the number system. And that's a cognitive science principle that whenever the brain is trying to learn something new, it's always trying to connect it to something that it already knows. And when we could connect it to the number system, then as a cognitive scientist called that an anchor, developing an anchor. So I always like to tell students, when you're learning something new, try to think of something familiar that this reminds you of. And when you can connect those things, it's going to help you to remember that information. Now, as you heard, I didn't know this information as recently as about 20 years ago. And so I started reading a lot of things I could get, my, anything I could get my hands on. How people learn is an excellent reference. And um, there are things that we know about learning now that we didn't before. We know that active learning is much more lasting than passive learning. We know that thinking about thinking is very important. Using the term metacognition with students, helping them understand what that is. And we know that the level at which learning occurs is important, and that's where Bloom's taxonomy comes in. And this is just Bloom's taxonomy, for those of us who might not be familiar. And I know that when Bloom's did it, he didn't mean it as a hierarchy. But I like to show this version to students because it shows that knowledge is the base. You have to know something. Many students now say, oh, I don't have to know anything. You know, back when y'all were in school, before the stone was rolled away, you had to know stuff. <laughs> but I can look it up. I can Google it. And so I have to help students understand, you can't solve problems with information you have just looked up on the web. You have to know some things. And then it goes up through understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, creating, etc. And I find that when we teach students blooms, they love it. They've never seen it before. And when I ask them to think back to high school and tell me what was the highest level of blooms they had to operate to get A's and B's in high school, just raise your fingers and tell me what level you think they said. OK, I'm, I'm seeing ones and twos. Uh, I have some data to show you. In 2008, the big bump was at two. 2013, it was at one. 2014, it was back to two. But you'll see it's mostly ones, twos, and threes. 2017, it was at one. And then when I ask them, now that you've been in college for a little while, what is the lowest level you think you'll need to operate in college to make the A's that you are totally capable of making in your courses, the amount of learning that's going to get A's? Raise your fingers again and tell me what level you think they say. 
Okay, I'm, yep, I'm seeing some fours. You'll be pleasantly surprised. 2008, it was at four. 2013, it was at four. 2014, it was at six, because if they have independent projects, they recognize that they've got to be at creating. Now, 2017 was at three, but this was a bridge program. I talked with these students before they had had their first college course, but even they went from one to three. And so that's the third piece of the puzzle, why so many students are not doing well. They were in study mode and not learn mode. They were working to make A's on tests, uh, studying to make on A's on tests instead of preparing to teach the material, and now we see that they were at lower levels of, of blooms. Well, how do we teach them to get to higher levels? Very simple study system, and I encourage you to just have mega copies of this thing on your desk, just give it to students and say, do this. Um, but the first step is to preview information before you go to class. And then the second step is go to class. You have to be there. And then the third step is to review what happened in class as soon after class as possible. And uh, it only takes about 10 minutes to do the preview and review, so they've got to do more than that. And we show them how to structure what we call intense study sessions. Take a minute or so to decide on a goal, then study with focus and action, take a break, come back and review. Students love this because so many students say, well, how many of you have heard students say, well, I just don't know how to study? Yeah, and they love having a system to study. And this is what we'll give it. Now, I know I have about three minutes left, so we're going to finish up here. Because uh, now I just want to show you some data, what happens when we teach these to a whole class in just one 50-minute session. This was a general chemistry class. The uh, performance on the first exam was about the same. Uh, but on the second exam, the students who were there went up. The ones who were absent went down. Two, I mean, one letter grade different. And we published that work in the Journal of Chemical Education. For the second semester course, two letter grades different at the end. And then um, in the spring of 2015, she asked me to come in and do it. And you see, this time we did it after the first three exams. And the average of the people who were there was actually lower than the people who weren't there, but still at the end of the course, they ended up with a letter grade difference. So this is a process that really essentially flips the switch uh, for students. The discipline-specific journals now are interested in publishing this information. And uh, there are really great partnerships on our campuses when our learning centers partner with our faculty development centers. And uh, this happened at um, the University of Rhode Island. And um, I was supposed to speak there in February. I got snowed out. And those two units said they were not going to be deterred. They did it. And they did the presentation to over 250 students and issued an Ace Your Course Challenge. And uh, these are the people who are engaged in it. And you're going to get this whole PowerPoint presentation, let me say. I'm giving it to conference, so it'll be posted on the conference website. Uh, but 83% of the students reported improved grades. Um, the strategies that they used are here. And 96% report increased confidence. And that's what students need, confidence. And these are just the, some of the things they said. My learning has become so much more serious and confident since I've been using these strategies for a month. And they gave advice to other students. And um, many of the students, once they get the advice, then, and they know it's from other students, then they will take it. And so I was going to show you this little clip, you, uh, but it, this is from uh, an AQ student who really was talking about the impact of a learning strategies inventory. And uh, so it's just, she said it was so helpful, she really appreciated that her instructor took the time to do it, that her instructor took the time to take them to the learning center. So you'll have this in the PowerPoint. So I want to end with the story of this young man who was a graduate student who, they've got to take and pass six cumulative exams. They take eight a, uh, a year. They have to pass six in the first two years or they're kicked out of the PhD program. This young man had only passed one his first year. So he started working with the learning center and the writing center, and we taught him strategies. And I can tell you, I would not have been able to get anybody in chemistry to bet me a dime that if this guy only passed one out of eight the first year, he could pass five out of eight the second year. And he didn't pass five out of eight the second year, he passed five out of seven. And he passed the December exam with the highest score in the group. And this is he, Dr. Algernon Kelly. Take a good look at this guy. He's the only person I know on the planet who has a PhD in chemistry, he's an analytical, um, who started every college course at the developmental level, everything. 
And so when he left LSU, he started teaching it to students wherever he went, and he was at Xavier. And um, I just need just two more minutes. I promise, I'm, okay, I'm gonna be done. Okay, um, and so these uh, emails, October 17th, this guy writes him, hello, Dr. Kelly, I'm struggling at Xavier, really wanna succeed, but everything is just ending with a decent grade, hoping you could mentor me. So Al taught him the strategies, blooms the study cycle, how to do his homework differently. One week later, hey, Dr. Kelly made an 84 on my chem exam compared to 56 on my first one, using your method for two days without prior intense studying. And then November 3rd, hey, Dr. Kelly, I've increased my bio exam from 76 to 91.5. And you see the difference in his mood from, hello, Dr. Kelly, hey, Dr. Kelly, hey, Dr. Kelly, <laughs> exclamation point. And he says, ever since I started your study cycle program, my grades have significantly improved. I've honestly gained a sense of hope and confidence. And that's what we want our students to have. So many of our first generation students especially, they come to college with the hopes and dreams of their families. When they start floundering, they don't know how to fix it. The families don't know how to fix it, but these specific strategies uh, will. So in conclusion, we really can significantly increase learning, but we have to teach students how to learn. We've got to make the learning visible. We can't judge their potential on their initial performance, and we can't let them do it either. We have to encourage them to persist even when they fail initially. We've got to encourage them to use those metacognitive tools for deep and integrative learning. And so, last two reflection questions, I promise. Who would you say is primarily responsible for student learning? Now, I know all three are responsible, but if you had to pick one, how many of you would say the student is primarily responsible for student learning? Okay, how many of you would say it's the instructor? Okay, the institution? Okay, final question. Who do you think students say is primarily responsible? <laughs> how many of you think they say the student? The instructor? Mm, the institution? Yeah, they say, well, they don't teach it. I can't learn it. And so I said, I said but if your learning were 100% your responsibility, is there anything you could do differently? They okay, go, well, yeah, I guess so. And I think if we ask ourselves as instructors, could we do anything differently? The answer would be yes. If we asked our institutions, could anything be done differently? The answer would be yes also, because all of our institutions have some policies that are not most conducive to student learning. So the reality is that when all three of these entities take full responsibility for student learning, that's when we're gonna see a significant increase in retention and graduation rates. These are some useful websites, these are some references. This is that new reference that I wrote. This is the one that's for students that's coming out in January. Thank you very, 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 very much.